Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and am persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Philegius and Homogenus. The Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant to him that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. Well, may the Lord bless uh, uh, that reading of that letter which was given to Timothy, first of all. And it's a word for us here this day. Well, this morning as we come together, just a word of exaltation. You know, on our Christian journey we need a word, don't we, of teaching to tell us about God and salvation. We need a word of instruction uh, to show us and point us the way how we can feed on the Lord Jesus Christ. There are times, there are moments where we need the word to correct us and to rebuke us. But in these days, look, it's a word of exaltation to encourage us. For every one of us, I'm sure, at this time, needs that word to help us along. You can't help but think of those who are working in hospitals and facing great dangers. Those also in the shops and on uh, shop floors. Uh, those uh, which have responsibilities, looking after someone perhaps who's ill. Those going into people's homes. And those, as we mentioned this day, who are unwell. And not only that, in your life, you may have uh, decisions to make, things you've got to face, people you need to see. And if you're a Christian, 
You've also got other responsibilities. You've got things that God expects you to do and those things that have been commanded. And yet, to be honest, we struggle with just the normality of life. To actually get back to normal is going to take a big step. Just going out of the house, facing people, you know, talking to one another. This is not easy. And there's a word I want to give then to you this morning once again. It's found there in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And it's a word given to uh, Timothy, Paul's helper, who was a Christian, a minister. And being a minister, he, Paul knew the difficulties, the suffering, the persecution that takes part, which is part of the Christian experience. Don't be shocked. To become a Christian can be hard work. And actually, it's a, a place where we're put into great uh, dangers. And Paul knows that, and he writes to Timothy. And he writes these words, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. There's an apocryphal story of a man called John who one Sunday morning uh, was struggling to go to church and he was there and he was telling his wife that this particular Sunday he was not going and there were many reasons you know the weather's bad it's not nice and then he says this but look people don't like me there and actually when I go no one talks to me to which his wife replied, well, John, you have to go because you're the minister. And we got a service this morning. And uh, look, when Paul then writes these words, he actually knows what he's talking about. He can tell from experience in the church at Corinth. He said to them openly, I was with you in fear and in much trembling. And we know that that's not an overstatement. Because it's also recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, where Paul had to minister to the church in Corinth, and such was the fear upon him that the Lord had to come to him and strengthen him and visit him and say, Paul, I have got many which belong to me in this city. So now you see what Paul does. He writes then to Timothy, knowing that he also will have the same feelings of fear and apprehension just perhaps like we've all got this day for coming to a place of worship doing your job within the week and here's the news for us this morning and really there's two things now first of all once again to know what god has not given we touched on that last week remember for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear well, here it is once more. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. And uh, it tells us something about God. Now, people point the finger at God. And what they point the finger at God for is this. The things that are wrong in the world and sin in this world. Well, there are some things you just cannot lay at the feet of the Lord. And sin is one of them. Every one of us has gone our own way and has been according to our own will. But there's something else too, which you cannot lay at God's feet when it comes to being a Christian. And that is a fear. Now in this world we have a, a fear. We Hopefully we do. The problem is we have a lack of the fear of God. But in this verse, the word they fear is not phobios. It's another Greek word which speaks of fearfulness, timidity, cowardness. And that doesn't belong in the kingdom of God. It actually tells us in the book of Revelation that no coward shall ever enter the kingdom of heaven. They're placed there with others who have done abominable things. And when you become a Christian, one of the things that happens is this, is that God gives you another spirit. And it's not one now of fearfulness or of cowardness. And so then, 
Uh, these are the things that we want to look at. Uh, first of all, that he's speaking now that it will be a resolve with Timothy to remember what God, first of all, has not done. That's worth a point. That God has not given us this spirit of fear. We know that because the Bible actually shows us and teaches us where this emotion uh, came from. And it tells us simply that in this world that God had made, which was perfect, there came the day when human beings rebelled against God, when they sinned. And when that sin came into the world, it opened the door for all other kinds of unpleasant emotions and reality. One was death and fear was another. And we read the story that what was the practice that God came to Adam in the cool of the day in the garden. And when you see Adam knew that the Lord was coming, he hid himself. For he was afraid. And God called out to him and said, Adam, where are you? And he said, I was afraid. Sin brings fear in to one's life. There's another proverb which tells us this, that the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no one is following. And you know that perhaps from experience. When you've done something wrong, when things are not right, you know there are people this day, they cannot enter into particular homes or houses, not because of COVID, because of something they've done wrong and it holds them in bondage and they can't do or go to the places and see those people that they once did as someone who knows what it is to have have done something wrong there are people always looking over their shoulder seeing if someone is following them after them there are those people who can never settle down because they're on the run because things which are not right within their life look when something is not right in your life when sin has come in when you've done that which is not good you have uh, a weakness which comes to us it doesn't come you see from god in the english uh, civil war although it went to every uh, nation ireland scotland and wales there, there was uh, many reasons why those roundheads were victorious they had a number of defeats it didn't start off well uh, but in the very history books what you find is this it was an incredible army that was made up of that time of people who were from this tradition non-conformists made up of congregationalists presbyterians baptists uh, perhaps even those days even quakers there were people who had been taken with a message of the gospel and so we're told we're told the story that when they would meet together in camp they would open the bible they would read god's word they would pray together they would discuss the things of god and some historians have marked that made him extremely bold for the next day to face the cannons and to face what was before them when you know god he gives you another spirit let me give you something else we touched on it again last week because when sin comes into the world the wages of sin is death and that is an enemy to our soul and being confronted with the news which we constantly are at this moment we're being told of the victories which death is having over this land and in communities the last statistic last night before i went to bed as they tell you that in wales 5116 people have died then from covid and another 100 new cases which now have appeared and when you're confronted with this news you see of death which is filled with uncertainty for people it's the great unknown what's beyond what will happen you know this paralyzes people 
And the devil is very good at using it as a tool. Now, you may know someone like this in your family. It may be you this morning. The very thought of what will happen after I leave this world, my, leave my body. There are two people who come to mind. One, I'm going back 40 years. And uh, there was uh, an English school teacher. He was, uh, as you were youngsters, he looked big and he was a big man. And uh, he was broad-shouldered. And he was educated as he was a teacher. And, uh, sure, he was good at his job. But there was one subject he was utterly petrified about. It was the topic of death. You couldn't bring up the topic in any essay. It would never be discussed. He would walk away. He never went to anyone's funeral. And the reason being just uh, how frightened that he was. And let me say to you, men are worse you know what it's like trying to get a man to the doctors, petrified, just in case there's something wrong. Last place you want to be. They may be hard men in town. I tell you, you go and visit them in hospital, they're just scared that they're there. Because there's this, which is then of death. Do you know, the wonderful news of the gospel is this, uh, that he has brought life and immortality to light. And the great news is this, through Jesus Christ, O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. But you need to know that this spirit of fear, which is now gripped, you can understand, gripped a nation, gripped people, because you're confronted with death, the unknown, day after day. Let me give you another place where this comes from. And it's not from God. It definitely comes from the, the media. It comes from uh, people. It comes from talking and conversation. Because that's what we're like as human beings. We know how to play on people's emotion. And I'm going to go back to school again for this illustration. And this, I doubt if it would be allowed these days. But those were different days. When we were taken to our primary school, it's hard to believe, but this is what happened. They had um, the playground, and then there was the classrooms which were made. And there was a blind spot behind the classrooms, which obviously the teachers could not then uh, keep an eye on. So what they had done was that they had drawn and they had put a yellow line. No one was to cross the yellow line. And the reason that no one was to cross the yellow line was this. A witch lived there. A witch. And uh, I must say to you, no matter how bad the kids were, no one crossed the yellow line. They talked about the witch and all the rest that lived beyond that line. Fear. Don't tell me that it doesn't work. It can operate in our lives, even now when you're adults. You may be more rational and reasonable. But you know what it's like. You can't help it. We've had some good news. We've had positive news. We're not told how many recover. We're not told how, how few people catch the disease. And now we've got the vaccine. The next day, it doesn't work. And all of a sudden, you're back within this fear. This does not come from God. And what's interesting about this verse is this. It was a verse that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones took in a famous series of sermons, which you can buy the book, called Spiritual Depression. And in his book on spiritual depression, he actually deals with some of the things we've got to face in life. And he says, look, that one of the problems that we've got is this, is that we've got to deal with the past that can get you down. You, you need to deal with it, and people don't know how to leave it, and you're bringing these things up in your mind. But when he comes to this verse, what he says now is this. You've got a problem now with the future. You see, with tomorrow, with those things that you're uncertain about, that you don't know about. 
the things you can't control. That's what Paul says Dr. Martin is doing with Timothy. He knows he's got challenges before him, great difficulties, and that uncertainty, and it's like it, and it's always been. It may not have been the BBC, but it's like that. Do you know what someone's done? Sin comes into the church. Paul is suffering. He is suffering for the gospel. People are being martyred. Paul tells him, this spirit does not come from God. And he wants to deal with him. And he also knows Timothy. Now how true this is, but he makes the point in this sermon, it's very good. That you see, we're all different here this morning. Some of you are more anxious than others. We've got different temperaments. And I can assure you, one has met, and you know them, the great warriors of life, champion warriors. And this has nearly turned them over the edge. They've not been out for a year. And it's their natural disposition. We are all different. But what the doctor does, and I just want to share this with you, is that you see this aspect of being fearful because of the gospel does not now depend upon your temperament. When you become a Christian, he doesn't change your personality. You're essentially the same person as you were before. But there's something else. God has not given you the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, a sound mind. How do we need that this day? Of a sound mind. And this is part of the gospel. And so he wants to remind to me that's what's happening in now that chapter. Remember certain things. Your grandmother, your mother, their faith, how they stood. Now you need to remember this. What God's not given you and what he has given you. And what he has given you, if you've become a Christian, you have known it. He has given you power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. This word, when it comes to you and it grips your heart, you will know it. It will change you, affect you. It will turn your life around. We're not speaking empty words this morning. We're not giving you little poems this day. There is the gospel of God and it has the power to raise the dead itself and you've known of that within your life. And not only that, what happens is this, is that the Holy Spirit will come into your life and you can read, for example, the very condition, this wonderful gospel, Remember those disciples uh, on that day when the Lord Jesus Christ died and they were hiding, the door was shut in the upper room. They were fearful, couldn't face anyone. The Bible tells us that. And there you are now, 50 days from that, and they're speaking to the very people who crucified him and killed him and they're doing it open in the streets. And you say, what changed in the very person here are these timid, frightened, fleeing disciples. Well, it was this. That Jesus told them, you wait here and you will receive power from on high. And so it is that when you become a Christian, you will know in your life another strength which is given to you. That which comes from God. Yes, we know ourselves. And if you want to know the history of the Christian church, it's been like this. Men, women, children have stood before flame and fire and death and martyrdom. And there have been those which have been weak and you cannot even begin to imagine have had boldness to speak and to stand and to give testimony. That's your responsibility. You say, I can't. There's things I need to deal with. I can't. People I need to sort out. I can't. 
He says, now you've been given a spirit of power. Remember that. Remember that, Timothy. But then there's something else, and this is important too. You've been given now love, the spirit of love. Uh, uh, that's come, and you've known of the love of God in your experience. Now, this is something wonderful, because if there's something that is able to eradicate uh, this emotion of fear in your life, then it is this of love which you have known. Let me put it like this. You know what's coming. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And what happens when a person becomes a Christian? Again, the Bible tells us, you know, you've been given the Holy Spirit and the love of God has been shed abroad within your heart. This is what you've known. Something has happened oh, within our experience and you can never underestimate the power of love which now a person has come to receive. Let me tell you, the problem we've got is this. And this is the real problem to your fears. The real problem why people are paralyzed today. Self-love. Self-love. And the only way you're ever going to get rid of self-love is to know God's love. God's love, which is poured within you and you can come and know oh the the great blessing think of it this love of god which sent his only begotten son to this world of sin and of death this love of god which was to send him to calvary the love of god which gave him up upon that tree on the cross the love of God in his Son shown to us, in his bleeding wounds and in his dying. The love of God which loved us to death and would never leave us go. You've known of that within your life. And that does something, doesn't it? It, it, it puts something within your heart and in your life. There's a power now you're able. There are certain ingredients everybody needs for living. Love is one of them. Without it, you're uncertain. You're full of anxieties. You don't know if you're coming or you're going. But now you see, you know this, that he's loved you. And you know what the Bible says? Perfect love casts out fear. And we've in a big problem today. Because now we're living in a time where people have great fears. And you know what the government's going to do? The government's going to lift, so they tell us, lockdown in a number of months. That may be the case. The government can lift lockdown. But it can't lift the fear they put in people's heart. It's gripped you. It's grabbed you. There's a spirit that comes into you. It will not leave you go. Listen to the words. Love casts out fear. When the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, he cast out those evil spirits. And although it may be that our nation will change, something's happened in the heart of us as human beings. And they know. People will tell you, I don't know if I could ever go out again. People have said that. And uh, what will break that hold? Only thing that can do it is the love of God. Remember that. You've got that. Do you know, it is powerful. You think of the, the mother who, who is not a great speaker. I mean, the mother who is extremely shy and uh, who may even be a bag of nerves 
even in facing anybody. And yet something happens in the school. And uh, poor old Andrew has had a tough time with one of the, marches in, <laughs> marches in, you know, opens the door. I want to see the headmistress. You say, what's all that about? I tell you what that's about. Love. Love for the child. For those they care about. And when the love of God comes into your heart, you're able to stand and to talk and to do and the things that you are needing and those who call upon you, responsibilities that there are. You've known of that within your life. There is this power and this love. Look now, there's something else. And how we need it. A sound mind. There's an epidemic, a real one, which is now in this nation. We've been suffering from it for many years, but it's now gone into orbit. And when you watch the TV and you listen to the radio, there's been something. Do you know why? I'll tell you one reason is this. When you take God out of people's minds, when people no longer know the sheer love of God and the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, when that happens, you see, no wonder you're going to be a, a, a people which don't know where they belong and what to do and have meaning. And then add to them a, a real catastrophe and a pandemic. And people are, are very anxious. And then add to them isolation loneliness, not able to meet your friends, then add to them the very fact which has been known for over 2,000 years, the Roman proverb, healthy body, healthy mind. All of a sudden, you've got people without God. They're lonely, isolated, filled with fear. They can't even go out. A great epidemic. But you know, this is what we have news for. He will give you a sound mind. And when the gospel comes into your life, the word here for sound mind is this. It means of judgment and of health. You know, that which is able to have a kind of uh, control upon them. And, uh, and fear does something to your mind. You begin to think things. You become paranoid. <sighs> Look, there's one thing that happens, you know, when people live without God, you actually can go mad. Do you remember Paul standing before, um, I sh forgive me, I've forgotten, I think it was Felix. And then uh, he's giving the gospel and may have it wrong. But Felix says to him, Paul, much learning has made you mad, made you mad. Whenever you begin to listen to those who deny the things of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel, you need to take a look at their lives. And there could be a real madness about it. Look, when you come to know Jesus Christ, you become with a sound mind. I'll give you a number of uh, examples. First of all, you come, don't you, to believe that there is a God. And to believe that there is a God, and he is one, and he is all-powerful, and all-wise, and all-good, is not madness. I tell you what madness is. Madness is trying to believe that your very flesh, your very atoms, the molecules, the pews that you sit on once never existed. But then all of a sudden, from nowhere and nothing, came into being. That is madness, which is illogical, unsound, unreasonable. It is much more reasonable to believe that what you see and has been given has come to us because there's a God who has made it. Now that, you come to a right thinking. And then you come, don't you, to, to a right thinking. 
even about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That means now his claims. You remember when the Lord Jesus came into this earth? When you begin to read the story, it's not myth or fable, but then you come to realize how true those claims are. He says he's the light, you come to him and you have light. You begin to realize of the truth of what he says when he tells us that he is the way. You begin to follow him and you know that that is true and he shows you and reveals things. And you feel that, look, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into a person's life, you say, that is not illogical in what he said or what he claimed that even today. And then you come to living, that you begin to see a proportion, see the madness that we have come to. The big thing is this, that we don't believe that we should die. We actually think that we're, that it's our right to somehow, look, every one of us can never put that day from us. And to live like if you can is sheer madness. But you know, your days, your life, what it's all about. Let me give you just these two illustrations to close. Because this is what God gives you. In the story of the prodigal son, there was a man who had living and had much fortune and was enjoying his life. You know the story. That's what people live for. Live for the moment, live for the hour, live for the pleasures, live for the enjoyment. Live, you see, for only what is now and live it to the full. You know the story, he comes, he ends up with no money, he's broke. The Bible puts it like this. And when he came to his right mind, and he began to think that home, his father had servants and they were eating. And I'm living here in this trough and I'm feeding from the food that the pigs have. That's what takes place when you become a Christian. You've lived for the things which are of no value whatsoever. You've fed your life on things that you thought would last but your belly is empty. You've come and you've lived your life and you thought it was great and then the revelation, this is madness. I have a father who's given me life and I need to make my way back. I've come to my right mind. That's the gospel. And it's what God's given you. And how this nation needs to hear it once again. He's the only answer to it. Really, he really is. And I'll finish with this. Because it's the gospel. And it tells us, you see, how people are in this world. Those who know him and those who don't know him. There was a man who came to Jesus and he was mad. He was deranged. The scriptures say he was possessed with a legion of demons. He lived in the catacombs. He lived out in the night. He was undressed and he was naked and he scared the people he came to jesus he fell at his feet and and worshiped him and you know jesus cast out those demons and then this is it they came and they saw him clothed sitting in his right mind how does it end and they were fearful. And those who don't know him. Look, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful this day for the gospel and the good news that you have given us. We're thankful for the blessing to hear once again truth that which gives us strength that which gives us life and hope and light 
We're thankful that we've come here this morning and you've known the fears and anxieties and burdens we've carried. And we've been blessed, O oh gracious God, that you have come and you have dealt with us in Jesus Christ. That we could, Lord, do what you want us to do, to live our lives in a way which is pleasing, to call upon your grace which is freely given. O oh gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you now and ask that the word that we've heard this day will go throughout this land and through many places of worship where this word of the great victory in which you have given may strengthen, save, redeem, bring people to know once again the liberty which is found within our Lord and Saviour. And as a nation, for all our needs, we're thankful for what you're doing. We're thankful for all that's taking place with the vaccines and with nurses and with governments and leadership. But we know that we need something else because, Lord, there are things which no vaccine can cure. We realise we are sins that need to be forgiven. We have, Lord, within our minds things which are unhealthy. But you have an answer and you have a solution. And we've come here today to know it once again. May your word go forth with mighty power. And may, Father, once again, people come to know the things, Father, which are of you, that they may once again, even like that man who was mad, come and worship you and be found in one's right mind. O oh, gracious, gracious God, uh, may you hear our cry and even for those that we want to pray for this day we think of those of arthur and those which are ill within this community those father which are struggling uh, for many reasons we commit them to you may people give testimony may father people find you and again once more that they will be uh, that uh, joy and rejoicing found in you gracious god we commend to you the week ahead then for the life that we need to live people we need to see things we need to do father for those which we need to give words of comfort may doors be opened may opportunities be given may we be ready and forgive us in the past when we have not spoken of you and given testimony of your great goodness and of your great love gracious heavenly father we desperately need you and know that this day this morning we have turned to you to seek then your power and strength may you forgive us for our sins forgive us for our lack of faith and believing but please lord be with each of us and our families especially and in the mighty and the powerful name of the lord jesus deliver us from evil and from temptation, for you be all the glory. Amen.